Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, as many of you know, my name is Jennifer Smith, and I'm the Executive Director at the Legal Aid Foundation of Santa Barbara County. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. I'm going to just start with a few housekeeping items, and then we'll get started. So first, I wanted to let you all know that uh, we are uh, recording this event tonight. And as you see, we are doing this in the Zoom webinar format. So for the time being, uh, your cameras and microphones are off. Um, so, so, you know, if you need to multitask or you're in your pajamas, that's okay. <laughs> we'll start with sharing some information, hearing from our staff. Um, and then later on, um, when I um, close out, will um, adjust the settings and open everything up so that if folks want to, you can turn your cameras on um, and we can all say hello and mingle. So what a year this has been. Uh, 2020 is a year that we will never forget. Uh, and we wanted to take a moment to just pause, um, reflect, um, and also think about uh, what what's coming ahead in 2021 as well. It has been quite the year uh, for legal aid and our community. Uh, and so what we wanted to do tonight is to just um, 
For many of you, you're, you're already well acquainted and familiar with our organization. Uh, and for others of you, um, it may have been a while since you've connected with us or received the latest information. So we're gonna start off by giving you an overview um, of our organization. Uh, and we'll start there. Um, and then um, after doing that overview, we'll hear from some of our staff. So we'll go ahead and jump right in uh, into our overview. So as most of you know, um, the mission of the Legal Aid Foundation of Santa Barbara County is to provide high quality civil legal services to low income and other vulnerable residents in order to ensure equal access to justice. And so the role we play is providing uh, legal representation to folks in court, legal advice and information, and also community education. And what we really envision um, is a community where low-income people and other vulnerable residents um, have meaningful and equal access to the justice system. So most people are very familiar with the role of public defenders in our criminal justice system. And we feel it's equally important in the civil justice system to provide that meaningful access um, to the justice system. And we're excited to say that we have been serving our community for over 60 years. And so since 19, uh, 1959, Legal Aid Foundation has been uh, providing services to those most in need. And so you'll, uh, you'll see the photo here. Um, this photo I believe is from 1989. Uh, if you zoom in, you might see some familiar faces. And so we're really proud to have had um, a presence in our community for that long, and we look forward to many years to come. As you may know, we have several office uh, locations. Uh, next slide. So uh, many of you know we have an office in Santa Barbara uh, and our, our lovely uh, old building that most of you know on the corner of a garden in Canon Perdido. Uh, but you may not know that we also have offices uh, in Lompoc. Um, so some of you are familiar with the Holloway building uh, right across the street from the courthouse there. Uh, we also have an office in Lompoc. And then finally, we also have an office in Santa Maria, again, also across from the Superior Courthouse, uh, just next to the Santa Maria Mall. Uh, and so those are our lo locations. Uh, and then I also wanted to give an update on all of our current programs that we offer uh, throughout Santa Barbara County. So first is our housing program. Uh, the primary work that we do in this area is eviction prevention and defense. Uh, and we really see this work as homelessness prevention work, um, right? The, usually what happens just before somebody becomes homeless or housing insecure is that they've been evicted from their home. And so we see ourselves as advocates uh, for families and individuals before they fall over that cliff. In addition, we also uh, provide critical uh, fair housing advice assistance um, and general landlord tenant information. Uh, in addition, we also have our Sergeant Shriver Civil Council program. And this started as a statewide pilot program that has now become a permanent program due to its success. Uh, and so basically the concept is, is that in certain critical areas of the law, um, in civil law, that people should be able to get legal representation. And those services should be provided in underserved communities. And so as part of this program, uh, Northern Santa Barbara County was identified as a particular area of need. We uh, provide eviction prevention and defense services, as well as guardianship of the person assistance and conservatorship of the person assistance. Uh, we have several other programs as well. Uh, next, we have our Family Violence Prevention and Immigration Remedies for Victims of Crime program. So many of you know uh, that this program started out uh, many years ago simply as a self-help clinic uh, for survivors of intimate uh, partner abuse. Today, we're thrilled to say uh, that we have three full-time attorneys uh, in this program, and their assistance includes um, advice and representation in court, 
on domestic violence restraining orders, elder abuse restraining orders, other family law matters. Uh, and in the last five to seven years or so, we have also expanded to provide immigration remedies for victims of crime. Those remedies include U visas, T visas, um, and other, other types of remedies. And then, let's see, uh, we have our Consumer Protection and Foreclosure Prevention Program. This, this program actually started um, in the last economic downturn uh, when around 2008, our community really faced a foreclosure crisis. Um, and we've been proud to be able to sustain it since then. Uh, and so we've sort of combined two components of the work. So first is the consumer protection piece uh, where we uh, assist seniors and other dependents, adults who may be at risk of um, financial abuse and exploitation. Uh, we also assist individuals who, who may have been victims of immigration scams. And then we also uh, continue to do the foreclosure prevention work as well. Uh, and then finally, we have our legal resource centers, uh, which are self-help centers. So as many of you know, the superior courts uh, are required uh, to provide a certain amount of self-help assistance to self-represented litigants. So individuals who don't have an attorney and who are navigating the superior court system all on their own. Um, we have attorneys at the three legal resource centers, uh, Santa Barbara, Lompoc, Santa Maria. Uh, they assist in a variety of civil areas, um, including small claims, unlawful detainers, restraining orders and more. Let's see, and then of course, um, our work goes beyond just our, our staff. And so we really rely on the goodwill and dedication of volunteers to uh, provide a more robust set of services to our community. Uh, and so that also includes our project outreach program, uh, which in traditional time involves volunteer attorneys who are out in community centers and other locations in our community um, who are volunteering uh, to provide uh, ba basic advice and information in matters of civil law, family law, and immigration. And then we also have a bankruptcy clinic. A lot of people don't even know that we have a federal bankruptcy court right on State Street in Santa Barbara. And, and that clinic is staffed with a combination of volunteer attorneys as well as law students. And so we are so grateful to all of our volunteer attorneys, law students, and even undergraduates who help make these programs a success. So our current staffing, uh, right now we have 19 uh, full-time staff and two part-time staff. Uh, so our leadership, uh, there's myself serving as executive director, our director of litigation and our finance director, and then everyone else is doing the good you know, the good legal work on the ground, our 12 attorneys, our support staff, and so forth. Next slide. Uh, we also are really uh, proud of our leaders on our board of directors. Uh, and so Becky Steiger is currently serving as the president of our board. We're so grateful for her leadership. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Alan Blakeborough, uh, just transitioned this year out of the president position and, and back into a director role. Uh, and he had served during uh, my time as I transitioned on as executive director. And so I wanted to say thank you uh, for him, for his leadership during that transition time. Uh, and then we also have a North County Advisory Committee because uh, we feel it's really important to have the voices of the North, North County community uh, as we do our work. And so we just wanted to share a few photos of our team. This is Juan Carlos Reyes, who's one of our newest attorneys. He's a staff attorney in our Legal Resource Center in Santa Maria. Also Kate Lee, this is Kate uh, working at home <laughs> with her dogs. She is, uh, spearheads our consumer protection and foreclosure prevention program. And then we'll share just some other uh, recent photos of our team. Here uh, is one in front of the Santa Barbara office. And then this is a, a, almost all the team at a recent uh, staff meeting. Uh, I'm sure many of you are used to the, the Zoom format. So 
So that's, that's the latest of where we are as an organization. So next we want to transition to, um, you've heard enough from me, um, so we want to give you the opportunity to hear uh, from some of our staff uh, who are on the ground and doing the really important work. So first we're going to start, um, we're going to hear from uh, Daniel Navarro, who many of you know is an uh, intake coordinator in our Santa Maria office. So here's more from Danny. Hello, my name is Daniel Navarro and I'm an intake coordinator with the Legal Aid Foundation of Santa Barbara County. And I've been with Legal Aid for eight years, almost nine now. So as intake coordinators, what do we do? Well, we run the front office, um, we intake new clients, we help attorneys with their legal forms, uh, e-filing with the court, translating when needed. But not only that, we're also the first voice people hear when they call, and we're also the first face they see when they, when they come in. Um, so during COVID, things have changed. Uh, I think the biggest impact is that face-to-face -face with people um, not being able to come in. Uh, so we really had to adapt. Um, you know, there's people with this pandemic that are hearing about legal aid for the first time. You know, they're reaching out to us. People that usually would not need our help are now coming to us. Uh, because people are scared. It's an uncertain time. Uh, so we've had to adapt. You know, we're working from home, answering our cell phones. Um, client meetings are now taking place through phone, through email, through video chat. Um, and so we're doing anything possible just to, to be able to assist and, and make sure that our services are still out there for people that need them. Um, you know, how does our work mostly impact people or what's the greatest impact i think it helps people um feel like they're understood you know um we help them travel or navigate the system uh, as easily as possible um and we want to make sure that we can help people who are really in need um you know sometimes just someone there that can explain to you how courts work um, how the process works. You know, um, some people are willing to do their own domestic violence restraining orders. They just need somebody to explain to them what's next. Um, so we're there from explaining something simple as the process to be able to represent them in an actual case, you know, with domestic violence uh, when they're losing their homes. So I think that's the biggest impact, is being able to help people that usually would not be able to get help. And that's just a little bit about us and Legal Aid. Thank you. Great, thank you, Danny, for sharing. So next we're going to hear um, from some of our attorneys in the Family Violence Prevention Program. And starting off, uh, we're going to hear from Elizabeth Diaz. And many of you um, are familiar with Elizabeth. Uh, and as some of you may know, she is our longest serving employee. And she has been with our organization for over 20 years. Um, and so we are so proud of her work um, on behalf of survivors of intimate partner abuse, elder abuse, and more. And I think, uh, you know, she's a tremendous example. She started off with the organization years back as support staff, later became a client advocate, um, ultimately went on to attend law school in the evenings on top of full-time work, uh, became a licensed attorney, and is now the managing attorney of our family violence prevention program. And so one of the ways we've had to pivot this year is even in, in preparation for this gathering, we were going to do a few more videos sort of in person with some in-person technical assistance and then with some of the, the recent things happening in the world, we decided to do more videos from home. Uh, we've had to pivot and adjust. Uh, so we had a couple different clips actually from Elizabeth, but there was one that stood out to me. Um, and uh, when she was sharing a, a story about a family that she had served. And so we wanted to share that with you tonight. So you'll kind of see she, the video transitions in. We wanted to share this particular piece of the video with you. Um, so here's Elizabeth. 
So the, as an example, not only domestic violence or restraining orders that we assist, but we've also uh, assisted in a case that I'd like to tell you about a guardianship where my clients were the grandparents in their 60s. They were monolingual Spanish speakers and they came to our office because their daughter uh, who, who uh, was murdered by her boyfriend, the father of uh, their three children under the ages of 10, I believe it was 10, um, 10 7, and 5. And so they came to our offices seeking assistance with a guardianship. They, it was about a week, week and a half after their daughter had, was killed by the, by the father of the children. And the grandmother was really fearful that child welfare services, the, the county was going to come and take the children away. And so tends, I tend to get emotional when I talk about cases and I, it doesn't, it happens each time. Uh, I think when it, I'm, I'm handling the case, it is a case that I am strong and, uh, and assist the clients, but I think talking back and realizing the severity of, the, of these children having lost their mother and, and this grandparents that have lost their daughter uh, gets a little, it gets to you, but it's, <clears throat> I will get there. And so the, the grandmother was really worried that Child Welfare Services was going to take their children away or the grandchildren away. And so she had come to our offices to seek guardianship, to get a legal guardianship or legal custody of their, of their grandchildren. She would tell me uh, in our initial meeting that she wouldn't let the children play in the front yard because she was so scared that somebody would just drive up and take the children away. So we did assist the grandparents in obtaining guardianship. Uh, the children, you know, they were, it was, it was a relief for the grandparents. The children were not taken away, and it was just something that we could help, that we can do. Um, so not only the domestic violence cases that we handle, but we handle guardianships, we've handled step-parent adoptions, uh, and we've handled, um, and we also are handling some immigration remedies, very limited to victims of domestic violence, um, which include the U visa, T visas, and the VAWA self-petition. Thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for sharing that story uh, with all of us. So next, we're going to hear uh, from another one of our attorneys, uh, Stacy Robinson. And as many of you know, um, Stacy is also a graduate of uh, UCSB and the Santa Barbara College of Law. Um, has become an a, a attorney as is, is, is her second career in life and she started with our organization as an attorney at the legal resource center and then more recently has been working in our family violence prevention program one of the th trends we've seen this year is sort of an interesting intersection um, between elder abuse issues and housing eviction as many people have retreated to family homes we have seen um, some seniors that are being exploited or being taken advantage of um, by people they know or their family members. So next, we'll hear from Stacy Robinson. Hi, my name is Stacy Robinson, and I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid Foundation, and I have been working in the Family Violence Prevention Program for about the last four years. And um, certainly the the, the pandemic, the COVID era has affected the way that we safely practice law. Uh, we've done most of our work from home, which obviously is a huge adjustment, but it's not always the case that our clients um, can get, have been able to equally adapt to these, these restrictions. Life goes on for some of our clients in ways that, uh, that aren't conducive to electronic communication or telephonic communication. And I had one client this year that was in that category. He was 100 years old and he needed help with restraining orders against his housemates who were trying to harass him basically into leaving the house. They wanted him out 
and they were taking all different kinds of measures to make his life miserable so that he would move out. And so I, in order to, in order to advocate for him, in order to represent him, uh, I couldn't talk to him on the phone because he was very hard of hearing. And I couldn't email him, although he was very good with email. His housemates, one of the, one of the ways that they were, they were making life challenging for him is that they had, dis, they had disabled the cable account. So not, he couldn't watch any shows, he couldn't watch his TV, and he couldn't email. He had no access to the internet. So it took uh, coordinating with his adult protective services uh, representative, um, uh, a, an attorney from our housing program, and me. Uh, we, would, uh, we would all coordinate to, to get him the help that he needed, and that often involved meeting him on site. Uh, meeting him on site and 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 helping to facilitate with signatures, um, with interviews, uh, oftentimes with his adult protective services and law enforcement to try and keep the peace. Uh, so it was a challenging case, and especially given the given the pandemic. But we we took we took our safety precautions, and uh, we made a real difference in his life. We were able to get him relocated. Uh, to a, a place where he is welcomed, uh, where he is, where he's enjoying himself. In fact, he just spent his 101st birthday at his new uh, group living home, and they threw him a party with balloons and cake, and it, and his life has changed for the better. So that's a case I feel good about, and I feel good about the modifications that we made uh, to 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 basically advocate for his safety and his, his happiness. Um, and that's my story for the, that's my, what's my feel good pandemic story for 2020. Great, thank you, Stacy, for sharing that client story. And finally, uh, we're going to hear from staff attorney, Lure Yen. Uh, Laura is also uh, one of our newest attorneys in our office. She joined us uh, last October in 2019. Some of you may recall um, seeing her at Chowderfest. It was only, I think, her first or second week of work, and she just showed up to Chowderfest ready to volunteer and do whatever needed to do. Um, and so Laura has been a, a critical part of um, our attorney work in North County in Lompoc and Santa Maria. Uh, she's a graduate of uh, USC and G GW Law, George Washington University Law. Um, and so you'll hear from her next. Lori Yen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my home slash office. My name is Lori Yen, and I am a legal aid staff attorney. Ever since March, when legal aid transitioned to working from home, my cat Naj and I have been helping victim survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, human trafficking, and elder abuse obtain restraining orders, family law remedies, and immigration relief from this room instead of the legal aid offices of Santa Maria and Lompoc. For the last nine months, I have talked and met with clients through Zoom or the phone. I've drafted and finalized and submitted applications, motions, and briefs. I participated in virtual community events and meetings and collaborated with colleagues. I've even helped add new members to our legal aid team and attended various online trainings, both formal and informal, and given a few. I've appeared in Zoom court for hearings, sometimes appearing in two separate courtrooms at the same time, and I successfully represented my clients in, and even won, full evidentiary hearings or trials. But this isn't to say that COVID hasn't presented challenges because remote advocacy can be difficult. One of the biggest obstacles that COVID has created is that it has limited even further access to the courts and access to justice. With staffing, staffing shortages, court furloughs, and a backlog court calendar, victim survivors often have to wait longer before they can receive temporary or permanent relief from the court. Their timeline of when to expect an order is pushed back, especially given the fact that many criminal cases just can't proceed, so their associated civil cases can't proceed either. In the meantime, while they wait for trial, victim survivors are often trapped in unsafe or stressful 
and re-triggering situations with no end in sight. This happened to one of my clients in one of my cases this year. The abuser was the client's former foster parent. He had abused her when she was a child and she managed to get away from him years ago. But recently, he moved in to the house right next door. My client came to legal aid to see if we could help her obtain a civil harassment restraining order. And we had our first day of trial in January. We weren't able to finish it all in one day, and so a second day of trial was set for March. And then it was rescheduled to April. And then it was rescheduled again. The courts were shut down, and even when they came back up, the calendar was full. And though she had a temporary order which protected her until we can complete our trial, she was still stuck living next door to her abuser the entire time. The court had made it clear they were hesitant to make either party move before the pandemic, but we knew given the housing crisis due to the pandemic, the court would be even more hesitant to make him move out of the home. So she would have to stay stuck living next door to him until the trial, if not longer. Trial dates were also continuing to be set later and later into the year, and COVID made it even more impossible for her to move. She was supposed to start nursing school and move away, but then school became remote learning, and again, she didn't get any reprieve. She was feeling more and more trapped, and I knew I needed to come up with another solution, and I couldn't wait for the courts anymore. So I reached out to opposing counsel, and we started extensive negotiation talks. Finally, we came to an agreement. The abuser would move not only out of Santa Barbara County, but out of the state of California if we agreed that we would not pursue the civil harassment restraining order any further. This was, <clears throat> this was done with the understanding that if he were, were ever to return, we would pick up right where we left off. We kept the temporary restraining order in place until the abuser provided definitive proof that he had sold the house next door and moved into a house into another state. Then we requested the matter be dismissed without prejudice and we all understood that he was to stay away and not return to Santa Barbara County to live. We got her most desirable outcome, him moving out and her not seeing, having to see him, months before we were even scheduled to go back to court to pick a trial date. She didn't get the restraining order, but she got what she ultimately wanted and needed. She got safety and freedom from him. This is just one instance of how COVID has pushed me to be more creative as a lawyer and think of more holistic approaches to solving my client's issues. In that case, Sometime in April, after talking to her, I realized that even if we got the best results and the three-year restraining order was granted, and even if we could do it as soon as humanly possible, she was still due to be trapped in her phone, home, living next door to her abuser for months. She, all that time, she would be constantly reminded and triggered by his presence. By negotiating with opposing counsel, we were able to move up the timeline and I was able to give her the relief and the sense of safety she wanted most. Whether remote advocacy and virtual learning continues and to what degree it continues once the pandemic ends is still up in the air. But regardless of what it looks like or what it means to be a legal aid lawyer in an era of remote advocacy, legal aid's goal remains the same and my job remains the same. My job is to help victim survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, child abuse, and elder abuse in North County, Santa Barbara, get restraining orders, family law relief, and immigration remedies. Thank you all so much for supporting my work and legal aid work in general. I hope everyone has a happy and safe holiday season. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lore, for sharing that story with all of us. Uh, and I'm so proud of the entire family violence prevention attorney team and all of the staff that support them in their critical work. So next, we're going to move into um, discussing uh, some of the accomplishments that we've had over the past year and more about how you can support the good work that all of these attorneys are doing. 
So uh, to start off and looking back at the last year, as you have heard, we successfully uh, transitioned our three offices and the court self-help centers um, to remote operations without interruption. So we were able to continue to provide services um, and we relied a lot on phones and email. Uh, we created some new ways to do intake online um, and successfully uh, kept our doors open to ensure that people could get the legal assistance that they needed. Um, and I was really proud of my team. I know that we've all been learning about how to do remote work. Um, and so I'm really proud of my team, uh, even though at times it was challenging, um, everybody helped each other out and it was really a team effort to make that happen. Um, in addition, some other accomplishments, uh, next slide, is that we also secured Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, this is uh, some of our remote work environment. Uh, so this is my uh, <laughs> this is my executive assistant, Tony. <laughs> uh, I'm sure some some of you are used to this. Uh, and we also have uh, Trish Geyer, our finance director, uh, and her dog Marcel, who is her personal assistant as well. So I'm sure many of you have seen these scenes uh, from the work from home environment. And so and now next, um, in terms of one additional accomplishment this year is the, the County of Santa Barbara actually reached out to us um, and asked, um, asked us to pr provide the support to the community. We secured funding to assist applicants for emergency rental assistance. Uh, and this was for residents of unincorporated Santa Barbara County, but also certain partner cities, uh, including Santa Maria, Goleta, Carpinteria, and some of the other small cities in the San Ynez Valley. And this assistance was particularly important for those who had limited English proficiency. So for monolingual Spanish speakers who needed help, um, needed just some guidance to get through uh, the application, our team was there to support. And then in addition, we could serve as that link between getting the rental assistance and getting the legal information that they needed to, to navigate everything. Um, so that work was happening between um, March all the way through to December. Um, so we were really proud to be part of that effort. Uh, in addition, we're really proud of our partnerships, um, right? We are just one piece of the puzzle. Um, we know that our clients have needs that go beyond just the legal services that we can provide. And we really want to look at the client holistically in terms of their needs. And so we've always had all types of informal partnerships within um, the nonprofit community, but we have some formal partnerships as well that we're really proud of. So one is with Family Service Agency um, to assist seniors. We also partner with Domestic Violence Solutions, uh, who many of you know is our shelter provider for survivors of intimate partner abuse. And then uh, just recently, we started a partnership with the San Luis Obispo Legal Assistance Foundation uh, for a regional project for foreclosure prevention services. So we are now um, serving as sort of the, the expert uh, and the support to help ensure that these services can uh, happen in San Luis Obispo County as well. So we're really proud of all of those formal partnerships and also all of the different nonprofit partners that we work with to serve our clients. And then uh, our legal team is developing more expertise over time. And then with that, they're increasingly taking on more complex cases. And so in fiscal year 1920, Legal Aid secured over $425,000 for clients either in uh, back awards, court ordered awards, or through various settlement agreements and negotiations. And then in addition, our team also eliminated over $350,000 in claimed amounts against our clients. Um, so put together, that's a total of $775,000 um, that's back in the hands of our clients so that they can meet their very basic needs, that they can pay rent, that they can buy food um, and, and have those critical dollars that they need to live. 
So looking ahead, we, we do also see um, you know, certain challenges and opportunities. The most obvious one, of course, is the ongoing um, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we know that there's an increased number of residents who are at risk um, of eviction and, and also foreclosure. Um, and this may lead to you know, increased housing insecurity and homelessness. Um, and so we are daily evaluating you know, what we can do to be able to respond to this need. In addition, um, we're also continuing to think creatively about meeting the needs um, of survivors of intimate partner violence, elder abuse, and so forth, who you know, may still be kind of you know, stuck at home in an abusive environment. Uh, and then also for our Santa Barbara office building, um, which many of you know is a, is a historic building. Uh, we do have ongoing uh, maintenance and upgrades to do to that Santa Barbara office as well. Um, so I'm sure we could probably talk at length about various challenges, but those are some of the, the key ones that we see. And so why does your support matter? Um, I mean, as many of you know, ensuring fairness in our justice system, it's a fundamental American value. And there's been a lot of discussion in this year regarding racial justice and our criminal justice system. Um, but we really believe um, that, that we need equal access to justice in the civil justice system as well. Um, and I think there's also important conversations going on about providing that meaningful access to folks in the civil side too. And really, um, even in civil court, it may be your home, your safety, or your family that's on the line. Um, and you deserve legal protection and legal rep representation to have a fair shot in our system. And despite some of the stereotypes about Santa Barbara County, um, just many residents in our community cannot afford the legal help that they need when they're facing these life-threatening, life-changing situations, such as domestic violence, or an unlawful eviction. And so really our services can mean the difference, you know, between um, keeping, keeping your home, keeping housing, or being forced out onto the streets or into cars. Um, and our services also reduce domestic violence um, by helping victims and their children um, achieve protection, achieve independence and to escape those violent situations. And really in all of our work throughout our programs, our goal is to get to problems early and to prevent problems from escalating further. Uh, and so this was actually a, a, a note that we received in the last month uh, from one of our clients um, who stated that this year has been extremely stressful. Thank you for helping to lighten the load and for making such a positive impact in our lives. And so what I can tell you is that even though some of our, the nature of our work remains confidential, that your support truly does make a difference in the lives of our clients. So how can you um, support this work? So you can give the gift of justice. So first, uh, you might consider becoming a monthly donor. Um, some people are in a position this year where they may not be incurring um, commuting costs that they would normally have in a typical year. So maybe some of the monthly dollars that you were previously putting towards gas, um, you could put in towards a monthly uh, donation to support legal aid. Uh, so we have all of the information on our website um, at www.lafsbc.org. Um, slash donate and you can um, give a year-end gift or become a monthly donor um, whatever position you're in all that information is there I know that many of you prefer the good old-fashioned way of mailing a check um, and again that information is also available on our website about with our address and and how to make out the check and so forth um, and then we're excited to try something new tonight um, is that you can actually just send a text message and give. So if you send um, a text message, and if you just include the phrase LAFSBC, so that's our acronym, 
So that's L-A-F-S-B-C, and you send it to the number 44321. Uh, you'll get a link to a donation form, and you can do that right now. Um, and just fill that out. It also gives you the option for those of you that are linked to PayPal um, to just link to your PayPal and make a donation. So that's something you can easily do tonight. Um, and in fact, in a moment or two, we can actually check in uh, and see live uh, any uh, text donations that are coming in. So uh, once again, it's a text to LAFSBC and you text it to 44321 and uh, you'll, get that, you'll get that link to the form. So many different ways to support our organization. Um, and just as an example, uh, let's say for example, we have 600 attorneys across Santa Barbara County. And if each one of those attorneys donated just one billable hour, let's call that $350 for that hour we would raise over $200,000 to ensure equal access to justice. That's a family that's able to stay in their home. That's uh, a woman and her children who are able to stay safe from abuse. Um, it's amazing the impact. And those of you who are connected to the legal community, I think have, have a real insight as to why legal aid is important. So I think those of you who have any kind of connection to the legal world, um, you, you all serve as our voice um, to help share with the community why these services are so important. So um, with that in mind, again, um, if you would like to give tonight, you can send that text message to LAFSBC um, and fill out that form and we can watch that come in live. Um, but really, on behalf of the entire team um, at the Legal Aid Foundation, I wanted to thank all of you. Um, it's been a difficult year for our community. We know it's been a difficult year for many businesses, um, but your support really matters. Um, and I love to share, you know, um, information with the team about all of the support that we receive from the community. So. On behalf of the entire team, we want to thank you for all of that support. So uh, we're, what we're going to do is going to take a few minutes now, um, sort of behind the scenes, we're gonna be adjusting the um, permissions and settings so that you can um, turn on your mics, turn on your videos, um, and we can all gather briefly and, and informally say hello and greet each other. Uh, and someone may be the first to do a text to donate. We'll wait and see. Might take a few minutes for you to fill that in. Um, but we'll take a few minutes to gather. Uh, and if you'd like to turn on your camera, you can. Um, and we'll do a, a little toast um, to access. So if you do, if you do have a <laughs> beverage with you, um, you can share that. Hello, everyone. Oh, it's so great to see everybody. Hi. Hello. Hey, one of the great things about um, getting together in this, oh my goodness, uh, Anais. So I'm so um, pleased to say um, Anais is one of our former um, intake coordinators and a graduate of UC Santa Barbara and is joining us from, I think, Los Angeles? Or Orange County. So welcome. And the fun thing about this uh, virtual environment is folks can join from anywhere um, across the state or across the country. Uh, I see that my mom is here with us from San Diego, Beverly. Um, and wow, so many of you. It's so great to see everyone. Yay. Fantastic. Well, I just wanted to give a toast. It's been uh, Really, this is a year we, we all will never forget. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for your support uh, for Access to Justice. And uh, thank you for being here this evening. So cheers. Cheers, Jennifer. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> OK, well, I'm happy to, to just, um, I'm going to you know stay on. 
certainly if folks need to hop off, uh, I totally understand. <laughs> Some folks may be multitasking behind the scenes. Uh, so, oh, and I see uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we have Supervisor Wolf and Harvey Wolf with us this evening. Thank you for joining us. It's so great to see so many folks. Wow, demo pages. Uh, let's see who Thank else. Thank you. Thank you for the all the work on that presentation, Jennifer. It was really well done. And and so nice to hear from our staff members and the great job they're doing for, for legal aid clients. Yeah, it was um it was a little bit uh, <laughs> of an adventure of uh, all of us like figuring out we were initially going to do some in-person videos <laughs> and then with how everything has been going we decided to do some from home and uh, that presented certain challenges and anyways it was a bit of an adventure um, but we're, we're glad it all came together um, right I think that's the lesson of 2020 is we all have to just pivot and, and get creative it's great to see uh, all the things that Legal Aid has done this year, and uh, and it's great to be uh, a lawyer, and it's great to be a Legal Aid lawyer. But it's that's what it's all about, and Legal Aid just does a fabulous job and and uh, shines a light brightly. It makes me proud to be a lawyer. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. I I do think it's. Um, it's really a calling, I think, for, for most of our team. And then, um, you know, and then even for, for folks like Anais or anybody who's, who's worked with us, I mean, I think you take it with you um, moving forward, whatever, whatever folks end up doing in their careers or their lives. Um, I think once, you, once you've touched this work in some way, it, it stays with you. So whether you're in private practice, uh, or, you know, serving on our board of directors or, right, there's so many different creative ways or, or providing volunteer services or whatever it is um, that, you know, there's so many different ways to support the work. I just want to say thank you, Jennifer. Um, Je actually, were Jennifer and Elizabeth and Kate, I was like, a, I think it was the second year at UCSB and I had never even interned at a, I think I just had like one internship at a law firm and they gave me the job um because they said that i had a really enthusiastic personality and that <laughs> literally was like the door that opened everything so um after that i went to work for a private attorney and i couldn't i every time somebody wanted to get a divorce or wanted a restraining order i just wanted to tell them to go to legal aid <laughs> so after that after i graduated i went on to work for the legal aid of i did u visas for a while for an immigration law firm for a non nonprofit. And then I went on to work for the legal aid of Orange County. Um, and then now I actually work for the Los Angeles Superior Court. So I work for the self-help. So I do restraining orders and I do divorces, child custody, child support. And I can't imagine what it would have been like if I, you guys wouldn't have gave me that opportunity. If I don't know if I would be where I am at now. And I'm consistently inspired, even though I know I don't, I'll see everybody very often, but I tell everybody how everything started with you all and the opportunity that you guys gave me, seeing you guys do the U visas. Back then, Jennifer was an attorney. Um, seeing you all do the um, restraining orders, the U visas, all the great things you guys did that Elizabeth did and Kate, that was what inspired me to do what I, what I do now. And yeah, I mean, I just think you guys do amazing work and um, you guys are so passionate about everything that you do. And it, as you can see, it really impacts people. I was only there for about seven months and that's all it took for them to really make a difference. Oh, yay. Oh, Anais, we're so, we're so proud of all that, that you have done. And, uh, and I can say too, and particularly um, Elizabeth Diaz has mentored so many um, uh, UCSB students over the years. Um, and so I'm, I'm really proud, uh, you know, that she has, has taken the time to do that. Um, and we always love, you know, hearing, hearing what, what everybody is up to. So thanks so much for being here, Anais. You're welcome. Hi. 
Hey, Jennifer, it's, it's Tim Harrington up in Lompoc. Hello, so good to see you. So good to see you. Uh, I'm relatively new to this, as you know, but I'm part of the North County Community Advisory Committee. Uh, you know, you had thanked all of us for the support. Um, I couldn't be any more proud to be part of this organization in any manner after I'm hearing what work is done by you and your staff. Um, I've been a resident of Lompoc for 40 years and there is so much need here and I know the work that you're doing and uh, I just want to say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Oh, thank you so much, Tim. And each, you know, really each one of our communities is, is so unique. I've, I've had the, the privilege of actually having worked in all three of our offices, um, you know, and each, each area of our county has, has unique needs, um, right? The city of Lompoc and the surrounding area has unique needs that are different um, from South County that are even different from Santa Maria. Um, and so we're so, you know, grateful to have a, have a strong voice from the Lompoc community uh, with us. Wow, and I see, we see we have several of our, our volunteers with us, our, our several board members, uh, a few uh, former colleagues. So it's just so great to see everybody. Let's see. Is um, was there anybody else who wanted to say anything? I'm I'm just want to be mindful of everyone's time. Becky, I Becky. just want to thank you. That was a your presentation was beyond expectations. That's, that was fabulous, and um, I want to thank all all of the the staff that puts in so much hard work. I mean, the, the hours that that the legal aid staff puts in is just incredible, and and the work you do. I think you were so spot on when you said doing the legal aid work is really a calling. Um, there are, I, you know, we told a few stories here, you put, you know, you had some great videos and that's only like a thimbleful of, of the great work that, that this legal aid staff has done. And um, I wanna thank all of our supporters who have done such a fabulous job of supporting us over the years. And especially during this time when it's, you know, we're, it, it's a struggle for everyone right now during this time of COVID, but um it, it it's such a it's so heartwarming to see all of these these faces on here that and all these supporters of legal aid throughout the years and you know if you're new thank you for for, for joining us and you know if you've been a supporter for a long time we, we i can't thank you enough for that as well um but jen thanks for a great uh a great presentation and to our staff i can't thank you guys enough you guys do um just an incredible job with uh with with the work that you perform Great, thank you so much, Becky, our board president. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I do want to be sensitive to everybody's uh, time. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if the system would automatically kick us off or not. Um, but I, you know, I know that you've taken um, time out of your busy schedules um, this evening. And so again, um, so many of you here are dedicated board members, dedicated volunteers, uh, current staff members, former staff members, other community supporters. Thank you so, for taking time of your, out of your schedules, for being here this evening, hearing some of these stories. Um, I do hope that 2021 um, will be better for all of us. Um, fingers crossed. Uh, that we can get through. Um, but thank you again for taking some time to hear about our work and I hope everybody has a good rest of your evening, a good holiday season, uh, and a good new year. So stay safe and have a good evening to all. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank good you. Night. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer. Hey, Jen. Good night, everyone. Bye. Have a good evening. Good night, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.